Hello and welcome back. In this video, we'll look at the histology of the lower respiratory tract and all the way down to the respiratory portion of the respiratory system and close it out with some clinical pearls. Moving down to the lower respiratory tract, we'll start with the trachea. This is a tube that is positioned just below the larynx. And what's unique about the trachea is that it has these regularly positioned intervals of hyaline cartilage rings. These rings, however, are incomplete in that they're C-shaped rather than being circular. This comes in handy because there's this muscular tube right behind the trachea called the esophagus. And as we swallow food down the esophagus, the passage of these bolus can be accommodated by the posterior aspect of the trachea. Other than that, the trachea is a fairly strong and flexible tube that I like to equate to the vacuum hose. The vacuum hose is flexible and it has all these regularly spaced plastic rings. So this design allows the hose to be fairly flexible. But thanks to those stronger plastic rings, this hose does not collapse when the vacuum is turned on. And similar mechanics applies to the trachea as well. As we inhale air, the trachea does not collapse thanks to those hyaline cartilage rings, which are providing the structural support. But because these rings are regularly positioned apart from each other, this design allows the trachea to be flexible so that we can bend our necks without obstructing the trachea. Pretty neat design. A cross section through the trachea will look like this. Here's the anterior aspect, here's the posterior aspect, and this eosinophilic structure in the middle would be the hyaline cartilage, which is not forming a complete circle. In fact, closing this circle would be a small bundle of smooth muscles. A higher magnification of the trachea at the boxed area will show that the luminal lining is comprised of the respiratory epithelium, the ciliated pseudostratified columnar epithelium with beautiful cilia there as well as some goblet cells intermixed within that lining epithelium. Underneath the lining epithelium, we have the lamina propria and even deep to that, we have this cartilaginous support, just the hyaline cartilage with its own support supporting structure of the perichondrium. And although in this particular image, the glands are not apparent, there are glands in the lamina propria of the trachea. So here's a different region of the trachea with the hyaline cartilage here, lumen right here, and the mucosa right there. At higher magnification of the boxed area, we can once again appreciate the respiratory epithelium lining that lumen, and we have the lamina propria with the ducts and leading into the glands. And as you can see, the glands are made up of these pale staining mucus secreting regions, the tubes, and a bit more basophilic staining regions that are secreting the serous fluids. So these are all mixed glands there, secreting once again the sero mucus secretions into the lumen. This would keep that luminal lining nice and moist and allow for the cilia to beat and generate the current within the fluid. So any kind of debris or dust that's been inhaled down here can be swept up towards the pharynx. And as mentioned earlier, the posterior aspect of the trachea is comprised of the smooth muscles. So upon higher magnification of the boxed area, we'll see the bundles of smooth muscle tissue. Trachea will eventually branch into the primary bronchi, right and left side, which then will branch into the secondary bronchi, then tertiary, so on and so forth. So these bronchi will continue to divide into smaller and smaller branches, carrying air within. Here's a histological section through a bronchus. Here's the lumen, and here's the lung parenchyma that the bronchus is traveling through. The wall of the bronchus is comprised of the respiratory epithelium, lining that lumen, the lamina propria with some glands that we can see here, and deep to that of course we have the hyaline cartilage. Now this cartilage support will vary in shape depending on the size of the bronchi. The bigger the bronchus, the more complete
feet and larger the cartilage that supports that opening. So primary bronchus, for example, will have complete circular wing of hyaline cartilage, but the distal portion, one of the smaller bronchi, will contain only a small plate or even smaller island of cartilage within its wall. As noted already, there are these submucosal glands that are identified, and we'll start to see some smooth muscles playing a little more prominent role in structural support and regulation of airflow that's occurring within the bronchi, especially as the bronchi become smaller and smaller. And lastly, the BALT, the bronchus associated lymphoid tissue, which is just another word for the MALT, the mucosa associated lymphoid tissue that are typically found within the bronchial wall. It's just called the BALT. And it is not at all uncommon to see BALT, these aggregates of really busy looking cells. These are all immune cells that are aggregated within the wall of the bronchi. So that's one of the characteristics of bronchial histology as well. The smallest of bronchi will then branch into even smaller tubes called now the bronchioles. The bronchioles are actually not even diagrammed in this image. They're so small. So we have to observe the bronchioles under the microscope. And here, we're actually seeing a couple of bronchioles. Here's one and here's another. Similar to the bronchi, bronchioles can be large as well as small. Bronchioles continue to branch and become smaller and smaller. So it's not surprising that we're seeing such a difference in the size of these two bronchioles. But histologically speaking, these are both bronchioles. Now this is where the respiratory epithelium starts to thin and we actually start to see the lining epithelium that is made up of simple columnar epithelium if that bronchiole happens to be fairly large or simple cuboidal epithelium in some of the smaller bronchioles. The columnar cells will usually be ciliated but the cuboidal epithelium down below may not even be ciliated at this point. Looking at the smaller bronchiole, we can appreciate that the lining epithelium is really comprised of simple columnar epithelium, and it does look like there are cilia on the apical surface. So this is ciliated simple columnar epithelium comprising the lining epithelium of the bronchiole. Another unique feature about the bronchioles is the fact that there are no cartilage that is providing the structural support, nor are there any submucosal glands. The lamina propria at this point is so thin that they cannot host any submucosal glands and by this time some of the cells that are embedded within the lining epithelium will secrete some of the seromucous secretions themselves. So no elaborate glands are necessary at this point. What does play a prominent role in regulating and supporting the bronchioles are the smooth muscle tissues. So there's usually this band of smooth muscles that go all the way around the outside of the bronchiole. And as you can imagine, contraction and relaxation of these smooth muscles can regulate how much air can flow into certain regions of the lungs. Lastly, the bronchioles is where we'll find these cells called the club cells or also known as clara cells. These are typically difficult cells to discern from standard microscopy, but they tend to appear more in the smaller bronchioles than the bigger ones and their cytoplasm is packed with clear staining vesicles on the apical surface. And what these vesicles contain are surfactant-like Substance. And when these substances are released into the lumen, it coats the apical surface of the epithelium and it reduces the surface tension of water so that for some reason, should these small bronchioles collapse, it is much easier to reopen these airways than if there was no surfactant-like materials in this area. The very last structure of the conducting portion of the respiratory system are the terminal bronchioles. Now these are the smallest of bronchioles where the gas exchange does not occur. In this diagram, the terminal bronchiole would be something like this, where the smallest of airway is leading now into really distal sites of the bronchial tree. And I really like this image because it's actually showing a longitudinal cut through the terminal bronchiole that is now leading into the beginning of the respiratory portion 
of the respiratory system. So the terminal bronchiole can be recognized by either simple columnar or cuboidal epithelium, although it's usually cuboidal, but it is also not uncommon to see some columnar epithelium there as well. And there are smooth muscle tissues lining the outside of the bronchiole. And one important feature is that from the luminal perspective, there's no interruptions in the wall of the epithelial lining, meaning there are no alveoli that are ballooning out of the bronchiole, thereby interrupting the continuous lining epithelium at this juncture. The terminal bronchiole would end right about here. And now this is the beginning of the respiratory portion, which is the respiratory bronchiole. You can see the continuation of the airway, but this airway now is sometimes thinned by the alveolar wall itself or leading into some alveolar ducts. So in this diagram, the respiratory bronchiole would be right here. So it's still a continuation of the terminal bronchiole's pathway and is still lined by simple columnar epithelium, but its wall is interrupted at various intervals by the pathway pathways that's leading into these bunches of alveoli. So to summarize, respiratory bronchioles are lined by the simple cuboidal epithelium, they have smooth muscles, and the walls are interrupted by the alveolar ducts, sacs, or even alveoli themselves. Alveolar ducts and alveolar sacs are even distal to the respiratory epithelium. These are the airways that are lined by the series of openings of alveoli. To identify these structures histologically, it is a little more advantageous to look at the lung tissues from macroscopic view. And here, the alveolar duct would be characterized by a continuous pathway of open space it's lined on either side by these alveolar openings. So what ends up lining this continuous pathway of air are these small, almost dotted line appearing walls of the alveoli. So that's the alveolar duct. Now that I've pointed out one alveolar duct, can you identify some others? And certainly here's one. I can see this one, this one. So lots of alveolar ducts. Alveolar sacs tend to be at the end of the alveolar duct where there's a common chamber like this that is ending in series once again of alveoli like that. And of course, all throughout this passageway of air, there's alveoli, so the gas exchange is occurring throughout these pathways. And now we've arrived at the alveoli. These are the spherical air-filled sacs where the gas exchange occurs between the air and the blood within the capillaries. And despite the alveoli being the smallest of possible branches off of this respiratory tree, they form the parenchyma of the respiratory system. And by far, when we add up all the surface areas of the lining epithelium of the alveoli versus all the other branches of the respiratory tree, we'll quickly learn that the alveoli make up the greatest surface area, which is a good thing for gas exchange. The lining epithelium of the alveoli is the simple squamous epithelium, which is made up of two types of cells. The most numerous type being the pneumocyte type 1. These are the flattened cells that make up the majority of the lining epithelium and pneumocyte type 2. These are not quite so squamous, they're more columnar in shape, and their function is to produce surfactant, which is an important secretion that coats the inside lining of the alveoli and reduces surface tension of water, thereby preventing the collapse of alveoli. And should there be any collapse of alveoli, it'd be much easier to reinflate that alveoli with surfactant present. One other type of cells that we might see within the lung tissues are the dust cells, which are the resident macrophages of the lung. They're called dust cells because these macrophages tend to phagocytose the dust particles that somehow got down to this level, and they hold on to these dust particles and a lot of times carbon particles within their cytoplasm, and they actually show up like little dusty dark and black cells. At higher magnification, we can see two alveoli really well. 
And another thing that becomes apparent at this level is that usually that all the alveoli are kind of all squeezed in there and are abutting each other. So while this is one alveolus, with its own lining epithelium and its basement membrane, which could be considered as the lamina propria, we can see that, that there is yet another alveolus with its own lining epithelium and the lamina propria or the basement membrane. So when two or more alveoli come together in this manner and essentially form a shared wall like this, we call that the alveolar septum. So this alveolar septum then is made up of the lining epithelium of one alveolus here and the lining epithelium of the neighboring alveolus and the basement membrane and the connective tissues of the two alveolar epithelium in between. And where there's connective tissue, there's capillaries. We can actually see some red blood cells coursing through this tiny capillary within the alveolar septum. The lungs are a surprisingly bloody organ. And that really shouldn't be a surprise. In this image, wherever there's the alveolar lining epithelial cell and underlying capillary that's coming really close together, that would be considered the blood-air barrier. So this concept of blood air barrier is an important one. This is the thin membrane where the gas can get in and out of the capillaries within the alveolar septum. So from that sense, the blood air barrier is made up of the pneumocyte type 1 cells, which are these flattened squamous cells, which have tight junctions so that there's little to no paracellular transport of any big materials passing through. So looking at one of these areas, where there seems to be a nice pneumocyte type 1 forming a barrier, like so. Of course, the pneumocyte type 1 are held together by cell-cell junctions, but more importantly, they have tight junctions within the connective tissue of the alveolar septum. There would be an endothelium of the capillary network. So let's say that that is an endothelial cell with its nucleus, and let's say that there's a red blood cell kind of floating by. In between the pneumocyte type 1 and the endothelial cell, there's basement membrane. The two basement membranes of the alveolus and the endothelium are actually fused and form a shared basement membrane. So the blood-air barrier then is this region right here, comprised of the pneumocyte type 1 that are all held together by tight junctions, the fused basement membranes of the pneumocyte type 1 and the endothelial cell. You can also imagine how there could be another alveolus abutting this number 1 alveolus with now the shared basement membrane here between the pneumocyte type 1 and the endothelial cell and how there could be another blood air barrier on this side of the alveolar septum. And you have to imagine that that is happening throughout this incredibly thin alveolar septum. So you could have lots and lots of blood air barrier here and on this side, so on and so forth. Let's look at some of the clinical pearls of the respiratory system. We'll start with emphysema. Now this is the condition that is characterized by the enlargement of the alveoli. But these alveoli are getting larger because they've essentially lost the alveolar septum that used to be in between, got destroyed by either environmental toxin or chronic exposure to cigarette smoke and other types of chemical irritants. So emphysema is one of the chronic obstructive pulmonary diseases. With severe emphysema, the patients usually develop shortness of breath, they have a hard time oxygenating their body, so they're hypoxic, requiring some supplementary oxygen. And in severe cases, they may actually develop this barrel-chested phenotype, and oftentimes the patients have difficulty exhaling the air that is stagnating within these enlarged alveoli. Next, we have anthracosis. Anthro refers to the carbon or coal. Cosis refers to the condition. So this is the coal-related condition. Anthracosis results from the accumulation of carbon particles that are in the air that's been inhaled into the lungs 
the dust cells within the lung parenchyma will accumulate these carbon particles, eventually turning the entire lung black like this. This is the cut surface of the lung at gross level. We can see all of these darkened areas. That's anthracosis. And for most people who live in polluted areas will have some level of anthracosis in their lungs. But those who smoke multiple packs a day for years or those who work in coal mines constantly breathing in coal dust, it can actually lead to a much more severe form of anthracosis, which is also sometimes called the coal miner's disease. Such heavy accumulation of coal or carbon particles within the lung parenchyma can further irritate the lung tissues, causing inflammation, and lead to almost irreparable damage. Here's the normal lung tissue in comparison. Histologically, a lot of these black particle containing structures are all the dust cells that have the carbon particles accumulated within their cytoplasm. And lastly, asthma, which is characterized by the narrowing and swelling of the airway that leads to difficulty breathing, which can be transient. Sometimes with narrowing and swelling of the airway, there can be increased production and secretion of mucus, which then further exacerbates the situation. As shown in this diagram, with the asthma flare-up, the smooth muscle layer of the bronchioles especially tend to contract and the mucosa itself tends to become inflamed with increased production and secretion of mucin into the airway. Thereby now we've reduced that airway space drastically, leading to decreased amount of air going into the alveoli, therefore causing shortness in breath. And that concludes the respiratory system histology. Thank you and see you next time.